Okay, um, welcome everyone uh, to this DHS2 annual conference session on malaria. Uh, as you can see, we have a very busy schedule and lots of interesting presentations to, to go through. So I think... Um, Hello. Sorry. Okay, Itula, your microphone is working. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so we have a lot of interesting presentation around the different WHO modules on, on malaria elimination and uh, vector control. We also have a few country implementation presentations around uh, malaria implementations in DHIS2. So I think we should just get started. I am first going to start with a little bit of an overview on uh, a project called uh, the Digital Solutions for uh, Malaria Elimination Project. Uh, so I hope you can all see that screen that I switched to now. If not, just let me know. So uh, the Digital Solution for Malaria Elimination Project, or DSME, is a project funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, managed by the Clinton Health Access Initiative with partners like uh, UIO, Vital Wave, and, and the WHO. Um, so this project has, has made it that actually malaria elimination has been quite a strong and quite prominent use case uh, around DHS2 uh, software development for the past few years. So it started with uh, the project kind of came out of a landscape analysis uh, done a few years back that was looking at surveillance system for malaria elimination. And it found that there were certain gaps both in uh, the information systems as well as mobile tools. Uh, and this uh, was how the DSME grant uh, started to aim to try to address some of these uh, gaps in malaria surveillance systems. So some of the objectives was to strengthen these systems both through uh, improving uh, digital solutions like Core DHIS2, uh, mobile tools like DHS to Android and another tool called Reveal. It also focused on, on rolling out and scaling up uh, all these tools in different countries, which we'll hear more about later in the session. It also looked at more um, common goods that could be used across these tools, including data dictionary, widgets, and an implementation guidance toolkit. And it also had a community, or it has a community or practice, which is a virtual community of about 29 uh, vendors and, and malaria program in implementers who, is, uh, who share a lot of uh, lessons learned and best practices across different uh, community meetings. So again, this is sort of how the, the project is set up with the project management by Chai. Um, a discovery process, which I will get more into soon by Vital Wave, technical coordination and implementation coordination again by Chai, but with all the other grant partners helping out. And as you can see in the turquoise with the core DHS2 development, as well as uh, the mobile tool for case notification, case investigation, and full site investigation. That was one of the things that uh, UIO has been leading. Um, and that I will show a bit more around uh, later. So very quick on the timeline for the project. Uh, it started with a discovery process where we did a, we uh, gathered requirements from many different partners, subject matter experts, implementers, country programs, WHO. We did deep dive in poor countries. And we then uh, selected the mobile tools to strengthen and also developed a software development roadmap to this. And after that, uh, we, we started uh, improving uh, these tools uh, as well as kind of uh, testing, feedback and field testing. And the current uh, timeline that we are in now uh, is going for, uh, uh, all the way until end of December, partly because of the COVID pandemic. So we have some more time to do the field testing, do more iterative software development based on user feedback, and also do uh, more uh, uh, monitoring and evaluation, which again, some of my colleagues will get more into later in the session. So again, this was kind of how requirements were gathered. You know, we're looking at different surveillance processes in the different countries where we did a deep dive. We looked 
try to look at common challenges across the countries and then have the speed into software requirements both for the specific tools and for the common goods. And again, to just mention that then we focused on, on improving uh, DHS2 web and DHS2 Android and the reveal tool as, and as well as some common goods. Just an interest of time on rushing the, through these slides, but they are also available on, I uh, will upload them to SCED after this session. And then again, the community of practice that I mentioned, these are some of the partners that are in this community of practice where we have regular meetings and share experiences and lessons learned. But I also wanted to focus a bit on some of the features that we have added into DHS2 Web and Android, specifically around the malaria elimination use case. So uh, over six releases, basically from 231 to 236, so for the last three years, this uh, DSME product has advocated for uh, DHS2 requirements for malaria elimination within a variety of apps and features. As you can see, um, it's been around just enhancement to the user interface. Uh, we've fed in requirements to the new capture app, both for events and tracker programs. Um, task management uh, around working lists and user assignment was a big um, requirement from this project. There's been also a lot of different improvements within the analytics apps, including maps, user analytics and data visualization features. And it also led to an improvement of the relationship model. So that would be more flexible and be able to link different types of records. So here's a couple of examples down here with the year over year charts, as well as multi axis charts, which was one of the requirements from this project. It's also been a lot of maps features, um, including polygons, which is a great way to represent foci and, and relationships between cases, which we also actually saw was heavily utilized for the uh, a lot of COVID 19 implementations in countries. And we've seen a lot of these malaria elimination features being very generic and being um, used in other use cases as well. And I like this example because it's an example from a map in Honduras showing col color coding Vivax versus false affirm. And then uh, we enabled an opportunity to do the same in DHS2 that you can style the points based on, on data values. I like this side-by-side -side comparison. And also with uh, Android, all the way from the first integrated new Android capture app release up until now, again, many uh, functionalities uh, have been uh, advocated from, uh, uh, from the DCME project. Again, including especially the icons and colors that you see in the screen to the left, the working list and some local analytics uh, and indicators per, um, for example, per uh, malaria case and many, many uh, maps improvements as well that we saw, saw some of this earlier in the week. Again, being able to create polygons for the full side, being able to visualize relationships between cases, and even being able now to uh, navigate or choose how to navigate to, for example, a case or something. All of these to really enable field-based uh, follow-up and response for case investigation and foci investigation. So um, super quick next steps. We're going to continue the iteration around these tools based on feedback from countries. And um, the countries, and especially Chai, will look more at, at monitoring and evaluation and tools around that. And I think my colleagues will add more on that later. So in the interest of time, I will now um, turn it over to uh, Malenga from WHO, who will present on one of the modules that they've been working on around malaria elimination. So Malenga, please go ahead. No problem. Seconds. You see my screen? Yes, and feel free to share your camera if your bandwidth allows. <laughs> it's not too bad. Okay, two seconds. There we go. Much better? Perfect. Thank you. Go ahead. No problem. Um, afternoon, everybody. My name is Mwalenga Yipumbwa, and I will be touching on the WHO 
um, standard malaria case-based package for, mal for malaria elimination. Just a brief run through, as we all know, surveillance is a core intervention when looking at the, the global technical strategy, especially when it comes to transforming the surveillance systems. Um, as countries progress towards malaria elimination, the aim of surveillance becomes to detect all malaria infections, investigate every malaria case, direct um, actions towards inter uh, interrupting transmission and ensure that each detected case is promptly treated and monitored to prevent a secondary infection. So through guidelines and recommendation, um, WHO provides global standards and normative guidance through guidelines and guiding documents. Just to mention a few, we've got the framework for malaria elimination. Our main working one under the surveillance unit is the malaria surveillance monitoring and evaluation reference manual as well as the test procedures for insecticide resistance, monitoring in malaria vectors, which you'll hear more about um, from my colleague, Lucia, who's up next. So what does this malaria module include and what does the toolkit for the malaria module has? Um, we're looking at two elements here. We want to strengthen aggregate and case-based um, data by improving data quality, um, improving data analysis and use, as well as data-driven um, decision-making. So W, uh, the WHO malaria recommendations are standard data elements and indicators are built into DHIS2 um, for the national HMIS system. So why the need for these tool standardization? We, we figured that we need to determine the core foundations of what should be collected, reduce redundancy, as well as improve relatability and um, reliability of data that is being collected, as well as to ensure consistency in data collected by providing standard definitions from our side. These um, data standards serve as a guidance for countries to assess if correct indicators are being measured, map their data collection tools in country, and review if country definitions and naming conventions are aligned with those recommended by the WHO, as well as identify data collection gaps um, within the surveillance system. So a next component of this malaria toolkit module is the analytical dashboards, much like what um, Caroline has touched on and how the community of practice has improved or asked for extra um, functionalities to be able to analyze data more um, precisely, as well as um, the net building training materials, um, which usually come in English and French, as well as um, training guides. Um, at the moment, we only have these for the ENTO module as well as the aggregate module. And the next step is to then provide this for the case-based module. So the malaria, mod, uh, the malaria module integrates into a broader set of WHO disease surveillance tools um, for countries to adopt. So we're looking at HIV, TB, EPI, um, and the work. So it's not only standalone modules, but comes as a whole um, integrated package. So what is this case-based malaria package that we're looking at? We're gonna look, I'm gonna go into a little bit more details and for um, the sake of time, not too much as I suppose. So the malaria case-based module has two components. We've got the case notification and the case investigation module as well as the focus investigation. The first part is the patient registration. Um, the next one, the next program stage would be the diagnosis, confirmation and treatment as well as case investigations and foci investigation. What we did on our side is provide the core minimum standards that are required when looking at a case-based malaria package for malaria eliminations that countries can adopt and adapt within their own country settings. We will think, I think we'll have a look at some of these best practices in the next um, presentations that are to come. The one stage is the enrollment scheme within the malaria case-based program where you have your case ID, where you have your basically your basic profile of a patient, of where you're registering the date of birth, occupation, nationality, um, and so on. The next stage will have the diagnosis and treatment stage where there's indicator section that summarizes the case. They display um, the stages as to where you are, the case detection methods. So, providing key um, core variables needed to collect um, your detection method, data on symptoms, case uh, confirmation and status, as well as previous history of malaria, um, date species identified as well as treatment. At household level, we also, give, we also provide guidance on the bare minimum that countries need to collect, 
where we're looking at the date of investigation and uh, GPS coordinates of the event. Um, recent travel histories in and outside of the country, whether it's a district level, village level, more specific to the country's, the country's tailoring of the tool, as well as case classification and any other comments that are related to the case. The last um, section in the stage includes investigation of the index case at household level, as well as we've applied some validation um, to increase data quality when looking at certain information that, are, that is critical um, and essential um, for case-based surveillance when looking at malaria. We also have a section on the nearby household investigation, and this is a repeatable stage. And once that entire um, set of activities is complete, you have our final case classification. to the registered case. Um, like Caroline also mentioned, more features were built around um, adding relationships. So whether it's a focus to a case, a case to a foci and so on. In additional through the DSME project that Caroline also touched on, um, one of the main features was the ability to draw polygons um, within the application. And this makes it possible to draw and visualize foci boundaries um, on maps and so on. The next step is our focus investigation and what the core, what the core variables are um, that you need in order to, to basically fill out this section, which is always um, a little bit of a mission as countries had no proper guidance around that. So you've got here your focus status. The main important one is your focus status and your previous interventions that were held out in the previous year within your focus. And then the next section would be the characteristics of the focus that might have changed um, from the last investigation that was conducted. We also want to know the insecticide resistance status of that focus that the cases had come from. And last but not uh, least, we've got your focus classification after all the relevant and necessary investigation have, have occurred, whether it's over time or annually at the end of, um, at the, end of the year. And also um, looking at not only having investigated, but what kind of response have we then delivered within this focus when we're looking at malaria, um, interrupting malaria transmission within that section. So that's rounding up in a nutshell what the tools um, in terms of core data standards have and just moving into accessibility, which is mostly what people would like to know accessibility is the next step is this case-based tools will be available to countries for adoption and adaption um, to augment surveillance processes in malaria settings. So we look at a timeline of the first release maybe being by the end of June, and then subsequently the training materials to then follow thereafter. We've had a huge demand in, 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 in countries needing this package. So then um, just trying to let it, um, just trying to put it out there for countries to use, even though we are in the development of finalizing the training material. Efforts are also underway to work with partners and donors to help countries in adopting and using and maintaining these tools. As well as from our side as WHO, we will continuously monitor the, up, monitor the uptake of tools and implement any necessary improvements as guidelines change or new recommendations um, come in. So on that note, I'd just like to say thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Malenga. Uh, just a note that um, we've added a um, added the link to the community practice topic in the chat where you can ask questions. I don't know if we'll have time for questions at the end, but either way, we'll if we do, we'll do it at the end. And then I would like to uh, give uh, Lucia the floor and, and present on the modules for ENSO and vector control. Hello, everyone. Do you hear me properly? Okay, so um, I'll switch on my camera as well. So hello everyone, I'm Lucia, also from WHO, and I'm going to be presenting the DHIS2 standard modules, specifically for entomology and vector control. And these are modules that are complementing everything that Molengua has presented, because it's essentially uh, part of the broad malaria DHIS2 packages. Uh, Malengua saw that in their uh, case-based modules, there is some information about vector control interventions, 
And these modules provide the ability to collect much more detailed information on the vector control interventions, as well as on any entomology uh, surveillance activities. So I'll see if this works. There we go. So the idea was to transform entomological and vector control interventions data into something that can be used. So there is a lot of uh, information on entomology and vector control data collected in countries in different formats, a lot of it on paper format, on Excel files. But because there is no so much analytical capacity and there are no tools to have proper analytics, a lot of this data was fallen unused. Uh, so um, we developed these uh, modules to help countries to collect and to use uh, entomology and vector control data to also help to integrate this data with epidemiological data and other sources of data relevant to make decisions on malaria control and elimination, to centralize or to rescue all of this data that existed in a paper format or in Excel format, and to put it all in one system to see trends over time, et cetera. And also, and finally, uh, to ease global data reporting. So as WHO, we often ask countries to report data to us on an annual basis to monitor global progress. And we wanted to make it easier for countries to report this data. So there are some uh, tools developed around the modules to facilitate this data reporting. Uh, just wanted to say, like Malenga mentioned before, that uh, all of the modules, all of the standard DHIS2 modules are developed based on WHO recommendations. And these are some of the documents in which you can find these recommendations for data collection or for monitoring interventions. Uh, currently, the modules cover most of the uh, activities that are conducted within entomology and vector control. And that means uh, LLIN distributions and LLIN bioefficacy monitoring, IRS campaigns and IRS residual efficacy monitoring, insecticide resistance, uh, surveillance of all those vectors, and breeding site monitoring, but also uh, monitoring over time the treatment, uh, applying larvicide and et cetera, uh, on the breeding sites. So uh, this is a list of the programs. So essentially, uh, these activities that I just mentioned can be conducted in several different ways at several different levels of detail. So we've decided to provide different options to address the, each of these activities. So you can see here the different data collection options. Some are more intended to provide um, a, a way to collect summary results, for example, from LLIN campaigns. Some others are more intended to allow countries to collect uh, daily data during a LLIN campaign or during an IRS campaign. So there is like different options depending a bit on the capacity of the country, uh, their infrastructure at uh, province level, regional level, district level, health facility level. Um, these modules are continuously being improved based on the experiences uh, in countries. So some countries are implementing it, uh, implementing them and they are providing a lot of feedback, suggestions on features to be added, uh, modules that we can expand, new modules are being uh, implemented based on this country request. So it's a, it's a work in progress and you'll see all of the updates to our website. Um, this is more modules in this case, these are the ones focused on, entomo on entomology. So we've mo got modules for insect resistance monitoring and again, uh, different types of modules to allow countries to collect data in different levels of detail. We've got modules for other surveillance, including the collection of individual mosquito data to capture results from laboratories, uh, laboratory uh, essays, for example. Um, and this is an example of one of these modules. I, I'm not going to go through all of them, just through one of them. Uh, but this is an example of how to monitor insecticide resistance uh, through the HIS2. So essentially, there is something called uh, standard bioessays, which you can see in the picture that countries are doing in the field. Uh, the results of those can be entered in data collection forms uh, in DHIS2. Uh, all of the mosquitoes that are participating in these bioassays may need to be analyzed to identify things like species, the mechanisms, the why they are resistant to, to insecticides. And here you can see uh, how we can register under each of these bioassays, we can register uh, each mosquito that participated in the bioassay through relationships, making use of these relationships that Caroline was mentioned that are now available. And uh, these registered mosquitoes can be sent to labs and insectaries for identification and analysis. And these labs and insectaries can enter the results of the mosquito analysis in different stages of the mosquito program. So that's an example of how we are making use of most of the capacities in DHS2 at the moment to build a nice workflow that connects the activities done in the field all the way to activities conducted in, in laboratories. 
These are some of the examples of the graphs for standard activities like procedural efficacy monitoring, insecticide resistance, uh, tracking um, LLIN or ITN campaign results. Uh, again, another way of seeing insecticide resistance data through a tabular format, and also, for example, tracking vector densities or human biting rates, et cetera, over time uh, for a certain uh, location in the country. So I just wanted to say that we don't, we not only have the modules as such, so we not only have the configuration DHS2 packages, we also have a set of applications that have been built around the modules to facilitate their implementation and use. So the first one is a command line tool called D2Doca, which is facilitating the customization of the modules to the national context in the countries and the country needs. Uh, the second one is metadata sync that you may have heard of during this conference, which is uh, now also supporting countries to install the modules and to keep them updated. So if there is any improvements to the modules that they want to adopt, they can easily do it with metadata sync. Uh, there is a third application, which is actually nominated as a finalist for the DHIS2 app competition. So if you want to see a presentation on that application, we will be presenting that tomorrow in the competition. And it's called the DHIS2 training app, and we will see a, a picture later. And it's uh, intended to be to build national capacity in countries to use uh, DHIS2 in general, but specifically the modules, because the application was actually developed um, uh, based on the need to have some training materials for countries to use these specific modules. Uh, then we've got an application to import data from Excel, uh, and this is intended to help countries to bring in historical data and partner data, and it's kind of uh, an improvement or an evolution of the Excel importer that you may have seen uh, or used uh, already. And uh, finally, Metadata Sync is also supporting the reporting of data to the WHO or to any donor uh, that has DHIS2 implementation. So essentially the exchange of data between the countries and um, as donors or even regional platforms. So this is a, a screenshot of the training app. Uh, as I mentioned, we developed this because we saw the need to provide training within DHIS2 to the end users of these modules. I'll be presenting this more tomorrow, but it's essentially an application that provides step-by-step -step tutorials uh, for end users on where to click in order to find the right data collection form, how to fill it in and submit the data to the HIS2. We have developed customized tutorials for all of these modules that I just presented, um, and they are nicely identified with icons, and you can see all of these in the demo, the HIS2 instance, uh, whose link I will post on the chat in a minute. Um, and then we are also tracking a global progress. We are tracking which countries are using DHIS2 for entomology and vector control. This goes beyond the standard DHIS2 modules uh, that I just presented because some countries started using DHIS2 for entomology and vector control even before we thought about the idea of creating a standard packages. Uh, some other countries have um, some data elements integrated into their health facility uh, modules or, or data collection forms to report on things like LIN continuous distributions, et cetera. So some of these countries are actually using the standard modules and some others are, are not, but are still using DHS2 for entomology and vector control. If you go into the map, you can click and you can find the details of what each of these countries is, or how each of these countries is using DHS2 for, for ento and vector control. Uh, and finally, I wanted to mention that this is a collaborative effort. This is not WHO doing all of this alone. Uh, there is a lot of partners that have contributed to the development of the modules and also to the applications that I just mentioned. Uh, we've got PMI, a uh, vector control link project that has contributed metadata for IRS campaigns. And uh, we are also working with them on establishing interoperability between their big DHS2 implementation and the modules so that they can easily report data to the countries, to the national ministries of health. Um, uh, BSI has been contributing ITN metadata, so metadata to support ITN campaigns, uh, mass distribution campaigns, and is supporting countries to use uh, the packages for ITN distributions. Uh, Chai, who is presenting here later, has been supporting countries to implement the modules, and Samin is going to present the case of uh, Mozambique, and I think also Namibia, the case of Namibia will be presented, uh, where some of these packages have been used. Um, and then finally, national malaria control programs are providing constant feedback as they implement the packages. Um, and DHIS2 users in countries and, and WHO have been contributing, for example, to the development of some of the apps, uh, like DHIS2 training app, which has been developed in consultation with several, several users. So this is a lot of links, just in case you need to have more information. Uh, we have 
videos, we have a website with a lot of information in French and in English, and then we have links to all of the applications and their information pages that include video tutorials, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so again, just saying that all of this was done to improve the use of entomology and vector control data in programmatic decision making and hoping that all of this uh, money and resources that are being invested in collecting this data are put to good use and are actually improving uh, malaria control and elimination in countries. So thanks a lot. And if you have any questions, please post them on the chat and, and I'll be addressing them. Thank you very much, Lucia. Yeah, the, um, there's at least one question on, on the chat, but so you can answer in the chat and we can post it on the COP as well. But in the interest of time, we will move on to the next presenter, which is uh, William Aviles from Chai, who will present a bit around some of the country implementations in uh, Latin America. Thank you, Carla. Can you hear me? Yes, I think so. A little bit low sounding. Let's just try it. Hello. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for being part of this session. Um, my name is William Aviles. I'm working with Chai as Health Informatics Technical Advisor for Mesoamerica and Hispaniola. I'm going to share today some lessons learned from um, the HIS2 implementation um, for Honduras and Panama. Um, yeah, I will start with Honduras. In Honduras, um, the DHIS2 implementation is now the national implementation. However, DHIS2 was adopted in 2017, just for malaria at that point. Um, I think we did uh, a very good job trying to um, establish DHIS2 uh, as national health information system. And then um, after that, I would like to mention that this is a national implementation including 20 regions in the country. And um, basically, now the DHS2 implementation of Honduras, um, which is the health information, national health information system, has a lot of different modules, um, most of them beyond malaria. And then um, I would say in just um, in the context of malaria, um, we have case notification and investigation uh, forms. And this is a case-based module. Um, we have the lab results also, and we are working with um, the Ministry of Health uh, for having the entomology and the vector control modules uh, in the DHS2 implementation. Um, right now, we are um, with the DHS to core version 234. Um, and the mobile application, the DHS2 and re application is deployed with the 212 version uh, at this point. Um, we are working in 60, with 60 plus mobile users, including disease, data entry, epidemiologists, and microbiologists. And um, this implementation um, is in five prioritized malaria endemic regions. In, in the country. Um, the experience um, so far, I, can, I want to share some successes and challenges. Um, one of the major successes for the first implementation, um, this is a full scale up national implementation. CIS is adopted now by the country as the national health information system, which ensures sustainability as mentioned before. Um, the system is not just only malaria, it includes modules like HIV, TB, and I think it's worth to mention, it's a patient-centered based uh, system. So um, there is a electronic and clinical file around the patients, and, and then everything um, is uh, collected around uh, the patient. Um, other success is um, they, in, the Minister of Health, specifically the information uh, health informatics office, they do a regular upgrade to the platform so they can take advantage of all the new developments that um, Caroline was mentioning. Um, basically, these new developments are, are being used to simplify the workflows 
inside the, um, the system to automate some tasks uh, to have better visualization and have better validation rules, um, specifically maybe uh, trying to limit options in the option set, like the cascade selection, um, which is part of the, uh, the upgrades or the um, improvement that the HIS2 has um, with the DSM projects. Um, also, <clears throat> they, uh, they decided periodic post reports, um, and they are generated using CIS, um, the Epi Bulletin Weekly um, is, is one example. Uh, there's no need to use another software. Um, they were using in the past Tableau to, to create some visualization, but now they are working with DHIS2 to produce these um, this, uh, reports um, automatically. Um, we have some challenges um, that we are trying to address. Uh, uh, we need to adapt and simplify some processes. Um, for that, we need to improve documentation and have a better definition of the processes, um, specifically talking about uh, how um, having SOPs for, for, for support of the user, for example, or having SOPs on how to um, make modification to the, to the forms, etc. cetera. Um, one of the major challenges right now is that the, the infrastructure and connectivity in some regions, that's definitely difficult the synchronization of the data. So um, this is something uh, we are trying to, to, to figure it out um, with some other specific type of projects. Um, and we need to keep improving the data QA um, to, 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 to have um, to work with the, with the, with the information in malaria. Um, based on the experience last year, I think uh, one of the major successes um, was the training adaptation using Moodle. Um, virtual trainings were required uh, last year because of the COVID situation. Um, so they successfully implemented some remote training and support using Moodle, but also Zoom application um, for the end users with the mobile devices. Um, they have integrated um, geographic information for malaria cases, which is um, a really nice feature in order to have um, a better analysis of the data for malaria. And in the challenge, they have um, at some point limited technology literacy in some regions. Um, at some point, the training are really difficult because they don't have uh, people that are really skilled at the use of the phones or tablets. Um, they have a, a high rotation of human resources, which is very common in our regions. And they, um, because of this rotation, they need personal need to be trained, um, and that really expense uh, and a lot of resources from um, from the Minister of Health. Um, also another challenge um, is the continuity of the technological team. Um, I think um, the country has a strong uh, human re uh, resource in, in the technological side. However, um, there is a high rotation of this personnel also. Um, now um, I'm going to talk a bit about the Panama DHS2 implementation and Panama uh, we are helping the Ministry of Health uh, to deploy implement, um, vector control data collection tools. Um, at this point, um, we are working with them uh, with the development of the testing and validation, what happens in the first quarter of this year, and the pilot of the tools that happen in the second quarter of the year. Um, the pilot was in the Comarca Nove, and we were working uh, with the data entry um, with on 11 ECTs doing household enumeration and collecting information about the IRS campaign. Um, the scale up uh, started this quarter, the quarter three in 2020, 21, sorry. Um, we, have, we have implemented the train or trainer model um, and we are adding three regions to, to the deployment implementation to have a total of 46 ECTs are working directly with the DHS2 uh, Android capture application. Um, as of today, the DHS2 core in this implementation is the 361, and we are using the DHS2 Android capture 241. In the future, um, based on the results uh, of the pilot, um, the Ministry of Health is really interested in 
um, implementing that net distribution and evaluation, and also the CHW supervision to the DHS to um, collection tool. So far in Panama, um, I think one of the major successes is um, to have everybody um, at they like the, the, the user interface and the user um, experience with the HS2. Um, in the MNE process, they, uh, they score 72% for the um, usability score. Um, in the general focal group uh, interviews, we um, everyone say that this is a helpful tool, avoid the use of paper, um, facilitate the work in the field, and reduces the risk of loss, total data loss. This is because at some point, um, this is some, there, these are some challenging regions to work in the field. Um, there, are, there is a lot of rain and also sweat and very uncomfortable situation for everyone. So uh, most of the time, um, or some of the time they could lose the data because uh, some uh, paper forms are, are being wet uh, because of the rain, the sweat, etc. cetera. Um, warning, William. Hello. Just one minute warning. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah uh, this is the last slide, uh, but I, I think everybody um, said that um, this uh, improved their ability to do their job. Um, this helped to, to interact with the, uh, with the community. Um, I think really important that the implementation was better by the Ministry of Health at the region level. They're using the DHS to tools and the analytic tools for um, analysis of the data, not just for malaria, but for other, other areas, the enumeration um, data is being used for other type of projects. Um, and the major challenge right now is the lack of the connectivity. Um, and they say they need some data summary on the mobile side to verify that everything that they've done is, is, is doing well. Um, we need to have a stronger enumeration, um, including the trainings when we were training the, the people. And it needs more time between the enumeration completion and the erase planning and execution uh, to have um, more um, yeah, time to plan and execute the campaign more effectively. Um, I think that's uh, that's all. Uh, I will stop there and um, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, William. So then we're gonna go over to some um, presentations from, from uh, Namibia and Mozambique. So I will give it over to Itula from the uh, malaria program in Namibia first. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Uh... Thank you very much for for this. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I'm Itula from Namibia. I'm a sector manager, and I'm working with vector control, and also into uh, surveillance. And we are dealing with collecting the data, and also do the uh, look at the analysis that is provided by DHS too. So Namibia is just a country in the southern part of Africa, with the northern part of Namibia, with which is the endemic to malaria. So we are aim is to eliminate Namibia. But with that, we have to, to eliminate malaria from Namibia. We have to have an improved surveillance, which is a core a part of our national strategy. The DHIS2 malaria information system was initially introduced in 2017, although we had, before that, we had the, the mainstream that collected information from other diseases, but they could not collect all the information that we want to address all the indicators. So with a built-in visualization capability and option for future integration. Uh, for Namibia implementing this uh, malaria information system, so uh, initially we draw out the health facility weekly reporting case based. And uh, from there it started also including some of the modules. And recently we just, uh, added to the entomological surveillance module as uh, my previous colleague was also talking of including uh, such modules. And so far, 
the system has more than 400 users across health facility in the Maria district that are using this and also the region every region is uh, able to use it up to the central level uh, let me talk more on uh, vector control which is my baby uh, vector control model in in the gis2 uh, malaria information system has five form under it and it's largely reported through the android capture update and those are uh, annual target, weekly report, and also insecticide tracking, plus uh, lavi siding information when we are doing lavi siding. We also enter them into GIS2 as well as the one for net distribution campaigns. So by replacing the paperwork, uh, the module has substantially improved the program ability to monitor the campaign progress. Because can, when people are spraying, because we collect data from village uh, level we can be able to see how is the progress and uh, what have they have uh, achieved by looking also at the the scorecard dashboard that we see when is at this level this is the color and when you see it's red meaning that they did not do well so they can also even just uh, even inform the team in the field that they need to they should not leave that village they make sure that they mop up and make sure that all the structure are spread or they get to reach the coverage of at least 90 uh, percent. So on my entomological uh, module, uh, this module was just uh, added and it's having six forms. So uh, three forms are about vector collection, the way we do our HLC, human land catching, the letter is spraying to measure also the resting, and also we also do the rubber collection when we collect the, the young baby for for the mosquitoes and we also do insecticide resistance monitoring uh, mosquito preliminary uh, uh, chain reaction so and also we also collect the uh, behavior on human being uh, which have uh, something to do with uh, where they are located what they are doing so that when they get maybe can be trans, uh, transmit malaria are they sitting outside with they are not protected or they are still inside a room which are sprayed or rooms that are not sprayed. And we put all this information together in DHS2 so that we can be able to analyze the, to be uh, to analyze them with together with cases and the spraying uh, intervention, like spraying uh, distribution on net to see how it is so that we can be able to see where exactly are we going because this make our work easier to do analysis and also to Forecast our response to relevant places. So we, with the DHS two, we are able to, 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 to import our historical data into the system using a friendly user import app available in the DHS two. Uh, with the program moving to, moving to the use of um, Android. Uh, capture user can accurately capture also the geolocation or geoposition of uh, a certain place while in the field for just mapping purposes and we can also be able to create our maps and see uh, where these places are if we want to even to do our response so we it's easy for us to, to go there uh, with dashboard which allow us also to visualize uh, vector composition, uh, distribution of uh, vectors, uh, biting behavior because they might behave differently from region to region. As Namibia is a very big country, so they even the insecticide that we measure and we have to look at it. We also need to see uh, in which regions or which district insecticide may not work because the mosquito have uh, grown developed resistance. Just uh, one minute warning. Yes, this, this will be my last slide. So on the success, uh, most of my uh, malaria data has been integrated into central repository, allowing the combined analysis of cases, supervision, uh, vector control, and entomology. That's why that's good that they are, they are together. And a series of uh, instance-specific training video have allowed for easy deployment and decentralized training. 
uh, because we also need to, to train people who are training, maybe they've been a, a long time without doing, uh, using DHS too, they need to be refreshed. And also uh, people who are just graduate, graduated and start working, so that we need also to train them. On the next step, we need to continue phase the switch over from Riga's DHS2 and trade app to integrated capture app and decentralized data reviewing meeting to regional level so that they can be able to, to review their data at the regional level. They will not wait for center to do that. And also upgrade DHS2 from version 2.9, 2.29 to the latest vision. Uh, because uh, the old the uh, old uh, tab that we have Android that we have we cannot are not uh, compatible with the new the latest version. Also, to enhance cap capability building on the Ministry of Health and Social Services, uh, staff uh, is ready for full transition to the system from partner. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then quickly over to Samin for our latest uh, presentation. And we'll try and end a couple of minutes before 3 8 p.m. <laughs> for the next session. Great. Right. Um, Go ahead. Let me just get my going. All right, can you all see my screen? Yes. Great. Um, so, um, um, so for this presentation, I wanted to talk through the process of developing a malaria data repository for Mozambique in DHIS2. Um, particularly because Mozambique was dealing with a lot of data fragmentation, not only within the programs departments, but also across the vast partner landscape. So you had different organizations and um, as well as academic institutes collecting very critical malaria data. So uh, the challenge was to consolidate all of this data. Um, and this was done in partnership with Malaria Consortium and South Digitus, as well as the Ministry of Health. Okay, um, so the challenge, essentially the National Area Control Program in Mozambique is relying on many different data sources for effective planning program implementation and monitoring and evaluation. So in their day-to-day -day programming, they rely on data from commodities, health facility cases, community survey data, supervision and data quality data, entomological surveillance, vector control interventions such as bed nets and indoor residual spring, as well as health promotion. Um, a national surveillance assessment conducted in 2016 found that the data was extremely fragmented and poorly aligned, leading to uh, one of the main goals in their new national strategic plan of 2017 onwards to uh, create a malaria data repository to host all malaria data. So the key surveillance assessment findings were there was multiple sources of data with different definitions. There was no standardization in reporting tools or a no standardization in how indicators were defined. Um, and this, there's also poor accessibility and integration of data and no automated outputs leading to a lot of manual efforts to consolidate all of this data across the different departments and programs, clean it, align it, and then try to develop reports and outputs. Um, so this is kind of the main challenge we were tackling. Uh, so the first step uh, was the national strategic plan was used to scope out all of the desired indicators to be housed in the malaria repository. Uh, so on the right is a list of all of their, uh, a snapshot of their different national strategic plan indicators. And we went through and mapped, uh, selected which ones they wanted to include into DHIS2. Um, and then second, the kind of harder part was to set all the partners together and align on standardized indicator definitions and standardized reporting tools that would be used for the malaria repository. And this was done through a series of design sessions with medical technical working groups. So through this process, we mapped many, many different data sources for all of these different modules. So um, for example, with an entomological surveillance, we had um, a DHIS2 instance used by a partner, a REDCap instance used by another partner, and then many, many different Excel sheets. Uh, same story down here for vector controls, just a lot of fragmentation of the data. Um, and so our kind of next step was to kind of figure out how to make sense of all this in order to develop the malaria data repository. 
So the uh, DHIS2 is very well suited for this because for any routine existing Ministry of Health information systems, so robust information systems that might have an API, for example, like the HMIS, um, which is also DHIS2 based and the LMIS, we could just integrate that data directly into the system um, and have that kind of routine data flowing through. And then for all of the other modules where there is a lot of reliance on ad hoc systems and Excel sheets, uh, this is kind of the harder part of designing and developing standardized data entry forms and uh, aligning on processes to start directly reporting that data into IMS via either web capture, via Android capture app, or via Excel import apps like the bulk load app. Um, so that all kind of, whether it's the program or an academic institute, there's processes to, for everyone to get their data into the system with common definitions and indicators. Um, this is where the WHO modules for vector control and entomology really came in handy because we were able to uh, basically adapt them for the Mozambican context and then just plug them right in. Um, and there was sort of um, clear definitions and standards that all of these different partners and entities could agree on. Um, so integration with information systems, developing new data entry forms where these were lacking and then um, compiling all the historical data, mapping them to the modules and then importing them so we could also have retrospective data. And finally, uh, the main end goal, which is developing dashboards to actually routinely visualize and analyze this data. Um, so this is still ongoing. Um, this is kind of a snapshot on the left of all of the different modules and all the different forms and what's in red is the what's ongoing as part of a phase two development while components in phase one have already been rolled out. Um, where we are now is that new data entry forms for supervision, data quality audits, and multiple surveillance and vector control are now being reported directly into the system by provincial and district focal points with a lot of intensive supportive supervision to emphasize routine reporting, data quality, and data use. Um, and then for the entire partner and academic institute landscape where they're also collecting core data, um, we're kind of defining clearer processes for how that data will be reported into the system. And this is where a, like really user-friendly Excel-based import apps like Bulk Load are really paving the way for sort of easy routine importation. That's not a huge uh, data entry burden on partners that might be using their own systems already and um, don't want to have to double report. Um, and then at the top we have, these are the dashboards that we've developed so far. Um, and that is it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Samin. And sorry to Magnus for going a little bit over time, uh, but thank you for and to all the presenters and for a really great session. And please continue the discussion on the CLP. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll end the session here. Thanks again, everyone.